What is going on, Future Focus team? Back at it with another video. If this is your first time to the channel, thank you, welcome. If not, welcome back. The purpose of this channel is to educate and entertain you, but the ultimate goal of this channel is to make you just a little bit smarter today in order for you to have a better tomorrow. And with all that said, hey, it's, it's only us in here, so go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Jesus, aspiring investor, just trying to learn the basics. All right, great, man. So this video we're about to do was requested by his, himself right there, Jesus, Jesus, wherever he depends, you know. But he requested this video, and uh, it's, it's a lot of the boring stuff that comes with investing. So, you know, reading balance sheets, and that was something. He initially requested to do something with mutual funds, but we couldn't do both because – as I was going through this, I realized like how tedious this is and how much goes into this. And to be honest, we're not even gonna have time to cover everything. I'm gonna cover a lot. Uh, I'm also, if you want uh, this Word document that I made, um, cause you may miss some stuff, uh, just let me know and I'll email the uh, document to anybody watching here. Just uh, put your email in the comments below and I'll email you a copy of this document that I made. Um, and it has a lot of great information and in you could actually take your time and read through it. Uh, but with all that said, let's get into it. I'm gonna share my screen. All right, man, so I'm not gonna go straight through all the Word doc. I'm gonna break up at some points to break the monotony and actually go and show the stuff in motion because if you take a look at how much like it took me to write, like there's a lot in this Word document. All right, so first we're gonna start with the basic fundamentals, you know, value of a company. And I'm gonna read it because all this information is, is relevant. Um, so valuation of a business by stock price. When a company is publicly traded, it is relatively simple to come up with a market value using the stock price. Say the company has 500,000 publicly traded shares and they are currently selling at $20 each. At that price, the worth of the total shares is $10 million. Um, a good example of this is a TV show called Shark Tank. Have you seen that sh show before? I have, yes, sir. Yeah, man. So uh, in Shark Tank, it's the same exact way. So there's those five investors. They're sitting on you know, their little thrones. The person will come, and they'll show them their whatever product it is that they're trying to sell. And... Um, They'll say, this is how much I'm asking for, for this much of my company. So they'll say, using this example, um, they're, they want, uh, what is this? Let me see, 500, 5,000. They want a valuation of 500. Uh, they're going to get a 20% valuation. Um, the company's currently worth 500,000. So the person on the other side will do the math and say, all right, that's uh, the value. What you're saying that this company is currently worth. Uh, 10 million and that that's how like really smart investors gauge if they want to be part of that investment or not so if you watch shark tank like it's a, like they always say that all the time so you're telling me this is what the company's worth what makes this company worth one million dollars you're giving me 10 percent of the company for one hundred thousand dollars so ten percent of one million dollars is a hundred thousand dollars so you're telling me this company is worth one million dollars what makes this company worth a million dollars does that make sense it does. Sure. All right. So determine the company's current share price. This is very easy. I won't even read this one because like that's self-explanatory. You can go on Google, you can go on Yahoo. Uh, you can just look at any, any ticker and you can find what the current market value is at that certain time. Can you mute your mic, please? Yes, sir. All right. So this is a, another one that's like very important, uh, finding the numbers of share, shares outstanding. And this is something that a lot of people miss. All right, so we'll break from here and I already have it up over here because I wanted to talk about it anyway. The, we were talking about stock splits and all that, uh, but I already have a few open right now. So uh, th these are different websites. You were asking about different websites you could look for for knowledge. So I, I, I put up a few as well. So I'm knocking out a few birds with one stone here. So this is one st uh, site right here called Y charts. But what we're looking for here is the amount of shares outstanding. So currently, as of today, as of this quarter, 
uh, Amazon has only 500 million shares outstanding, right? Because some people don't understand why is their stock worth $3,000 and somebody else's stock only worth $400? Like, where's that difference? And a lot of it is in saturation, um, how much is in the market. So as you see here, Amazon is worth, uh, they have 500 uh, million shares outstanding, but I have Apple up on a different page. Uh, this is Apple. So you'll see that they're ending in June, 20, uh, June 30, 20, uh, 2020. They had 4.355 billion shares outstanding. So as Amazon has only 500 million, you go to, to the stock over here to Apple and you'll see that they have 4.355 billion shares outstanding. So um, one thing you want to look at also is they're about to do a stock split, right? So they're about to put more shares in the market. So a four to one stock split just means it's going to be multiplied by four. So it, all you have to do is multiply this number here by four. And then they're going to have 12 billion shares outstanding. Does that make sense? Uh, so Tesla, I put them up because they're another company that's about to do the same thing. Um, they currently have 186 million shares outstanding. So they have less than Amazon does. So even when they do a five to one stock split, they're just going to, they're still going to have less shares out there than Apple does. So their stock is less saturated than Apple's is. Um, so this is something that is very important when you're talking about valuations, but we'll get into that. Um, one other thing I wanted to show you was the amount of sh sales that were short. So they have Tesla currently has 11.95 million shells, so, uh, sales that are short. Um, and I also put up right here what that means. So in finance, being short on assets means investing in such a way for the investor uh, that the investor will profit in the value of the, if the asset falls. So another way of putting that is puts like buying puts or selling calls is a way to leverage uh, if the stock were to fall and go down. So the, just some uh, information I thought was relevant to what we're talking about. But again, these are, I had it up on three different websites. So, you know, just give you three different places to try to get your information from. So this one right here is Yahoo Finance. This one right here is Macro Trends. Um, and this one right here was Y Charts. Y Charts, you kind of, uh, there's only certain stuff that they let you do for free. But let's get back to what we were talking about. All right, so we, 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 uh, we learned how to find the number of shares outstanding in a few different places we could do that. All right, so the next thing is we wanna multiply the shares outstanding by the current stock price to determine the market capitalization. capitalization. This figure represents the total value of all investors stake in the company, giving a fairly accurate picture of the company's overall value. And this is just one way. We're gonna go through a few different ways, but this is just one way that professionals uh, and even some retail investors that actually pay attention that they value a, a company. So for example, consider this fake company right here uh, with 100,000 shares outstanding. If each share is cu currently trading at $13, the company's market cap is 100,000 times 13 or $1.3 million. And this is basically the same thing we just talked about with the example I gave you from Shark Tank. So this is the, we're, we're about to get into the meat of, the, of this and this is what you asked for. So what is a balance sheet? I want to put this out there because there's people that don't know what a balance sheet is. So I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. I just want other people who are watching this to, you know, not have to go and look for information in other places. I'm trying to give them a full product. So just bear with me, man. I know you know some of this stuff already. Uh, so a balance sheet provides a picture of a company's assets and liabilities, as well as the amount owned by shareholders. A balance sheet can help you determine what a business is really worth when reviewed with other accounting records and disclosures, it can warn of many potential problems and help you make a sound, uh, make sound investment decisions. Um, and I'm gonna give you an example of a balance sheet and other things to look for, because a balance sheet is just one product that you should be looking for. There's a few other products that you should look for as well. Um, and I'll show you, you know, different places to find those. 
Uh, so the purpose of a balance sheet, what is the purpose of it? Why? Why do we look at the balance sheet? The purpose of a balance sheet is to give interested parties an idea of the company's financial position in addition to displaying what the company owns and owes. It's important that all investors know how to use, analyze, and read a balance sheet. A balance sheet may give insight or reason to invest in a stock or not invest in a stock. Um, so I Googled what is the most important part of a balance sheet, and th this first line was what came up. So the top line, cash, is the single most important item on the balance sheet. Uh, cash is the fuel of a business. That was Google's answer. Uh, so if you, there's uh, something they say in uh, business, it's called the top line and bottom line. So the top line is basically the total uh, revenue that you made, that the company made, and then the bottom line is earnings. So how much of that revenue does the company actually keep in their pocket for that quarter? Because they have to pay their employees, they have to pay taxes, they have to pay different things. Um, and how much of that money that they actually made do they keep? Uh, in my personal opinion, what I felt, not Google's answer, but my personal answer of what I felt was the most important thing in, uh, to look for, it was the EBITDA. So EBITDA is the earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization added back. So it just says added back, but what I meant to put was just before. So uh, EBITDA can be used to analyze and compare profitability among companies and industries as it eliminates the effects of financing and capital expenditures. So for those who don't know what amortization is, is basically during that quarter, how much money did they put in to pay off debt? That's what that uh, word is. Like uh, every quarter, or not, not, not every company does it every quarter. It, it just depends on their finance. Uh, some companies don't even have debt, debt at all, so this one wouldn't apply for them. But some other companies do, and they have to pay it either every month, every quarter, every once a year. All depends on the way they worked it out with their financial institution. But um, this is something else that takes money away from that, top, that bottom line. Uh, so uh, the reason you look at this one in, in contrast with other ones is that the EBITDA kind of puts all the companies that are in that same industry on a level playing field. Uh, and it kind of like lets you know, like it gives you a, a way to analyze companies that are different, uh, that are doing the same thing and how their earnings look compared to each other. Um, I also added this to kind of give you a, uh, a way to gauge it. EBITDA measures a firm's overall financial performance, while EV uh, determines the firm's total value. As of January 2020, the average uh, EV or EBITDA for the S&P 500 was 14.20. As a general guideline, a value below 10 is commonly interpreted as healthy and above average by analysts and investors. So is higher or lower EBITDA better? A low EBITDA margin indicates that a business has a profitability problem as well as issues with cash flow. On the other hand, a relatively high one means that businesses, uh, the business earnings are stable. Uh, so have I lost you at all so far? You good, with, you with me? Yes, sir, I'm still following. All right, cool. All right, the role of the balance sheet in the financial statement. So for every business, there are three important financial statements you should examine. Um, and there's two more that are not financial statements. Uh, we'll, we'll go through the other two later on. But so the balance sheet tells investors how much money a company or institution has, how much it owes, and what is left when you net the two together. So the next one is the income statement. It's a record of the company's profitability. It tells you how much money a corporation made or lost and the last one is the cash flow statement and this is one just more specific and is a record of the actual changes in cash compared to the income statement it shows you where the cash was brought and where the cash was dispersed um, so how to read a balance sheet a balance sheet is comprised of rows and columns that list the company's assets and liabilities and money owned by shareholders one column lists the category of assets and liabilities and one list the total amount for each of those categories. It may have uh, even two years worth of informa information on there. Uh, but there's always more information. You could always go to a few of these places that I'm gonna show you to look for the information and they go back like a long, long time. So 
Oftentimes, assets are listed in order of how quickly they will be converted into cash, and liabilities are listed in order of their due dates. Sometimes shareholder equity uh, follows the assets and liabilities on the sheet. You may want to look at the company's balance sheet to determine its financial health. Ideally, a company's, a company's assets should be equal to its liabilities and shareholders' equity. By knowing how to analyze a company's financial information, you can determine how much debt the business has, how quickly customers are paying their bills, whether short-term cash is declining or increasing, which is great. Uh, this one's a, that one's a very important one. The percentage of assets that are tangible, which means you could actually hold them. So factories, plants, and machinery, and how much comes from accounting transactions. And we'll get a, a, into it a little bit later, but these things right here are depreciating assets. So there's a, a place in there where they're gonna talk about depreciation. And what it refers to is things like this, like things that as time goes on, um, there's, their value is gonna decrease. It could be something like a computer, a laptop that they bought. They have to estimate in the next 10 years, uh, how much that laptop they have is gonna depreciate. Um, and we'll, we'll cover that a little more in depth. Uh, whether products are being returned at higher than average historical rates, how many days it takes on average to sell the inventory the business keeps on hand, whether the research and development budget is producing good results. And the company we're gonna look at is actually a company that him and I just randomly picked as we were watching the tickers on CNBC one night. And I said, all right, as they go through, what was it, the next five? No, but how many? I said, we're going to let 10 go through. That 10th one is going to be the one that him and I are going to sit down and look at the financial statement. So before you even asked, him and I did this on like Tuesday or Wednesday of last week. Him and I were sitting there and we're like, all right, the 10th the one to go by. It wasn't even exactly the 10th because one was ETF. And then the other one was like a, a can't even remember. It was it was like a metal or something, but it's something that it didn't really matter. It didn't have a company behind it. So uh, the one we're gonna go through is a uh, like a generic one that we literally just picked randomly. All right, uh, but they're gonna they they're putting a lot of money into research and development. It was kind of amazing, crazy. So whether the interest coverage ratio is on the the bond is declining, the average interest rate a company is paying on its debt and where profits are being spent or reinvested. To make sound investment decisions, it is important to know how to read a balance sheet. Study some balance, uh, this is just advice to everybody watching. Study some balance sheets to become comfortable with the number, what the numbers mean and how to use them to your advantage. So this is the next one that we talked about. I said, you know, that there was the top three things you should be looking for. And what is the income statement? An income statement will show you a company's profit and loss over a specific time. These statements were once commonly known as profit and loss statements. An income statement will typically show revenue or sales, cost of goods sold or COGS, gross profit, expenses, earnings before tax, taxes, and net earnings. So again, how much money after the quarter, after they paid everything off, how much did they keep in their pocket? That's what the net earnings are. Um, and just sliding away just from a little bit, the way you value a company could be the same way you, you're doing to your own expenses. And you're, even you as a small investor, myself as a small investor, compared to these big corporations, we could even do this to ourselves. You know, uh, we could make our own balance sheet, uh, basically like a financial worksheet. Um, and you analyze how much you're spending on your gas, how much you're spending on your car, your car is a depreciating asset. So how much is it gonna depreciate in the next 10 years? Because if you plan on selling it year five, how much could you get for it if you wanted to sell it five years from now? Because um, you wanted to invest in something else or you didn't need a car anymore because you live right next to your job. So um, this is getting away from what we were talking about, but just want you to think about in the small scale and in the, in the micro, uh, this could even apply to us as well. Does that make sense? Thumb up, thumb down, good, all right. All right, revenues or sales is the money a company takes in. Subtract the cost of goods sold to find the gross profit. From gross profit, subtract expenses, arriving at earnings before tax. Expenses might include marketing, 
advertising, promotion, general or administrative cost, interest expense, and depreciation and amortization, which spread out the cost of assets such as real estate or equipment over time. Subtract the amount of taxes from EBT to calculate a company's net income or loss. So EBT, once again, is earnings before tax. These numbers can be used in a variety of ways to gain insight in a company's financial health. So income statement analysis. Investors can use income statement analysis to calculate financial ratios that can be used to compare the company year over year uh, or you know, quarter over quarter or to compare one company to another. The same way uh, you had it the other day where you had those companies side by side uh, and you, you send the picture of it, just like that. For example, you can compare one company's profits to its competitors by examining its gross profit margin, operating profit margin, and net profit margin. Or you could compare one company's earnings per share to another, showing what a shareholder would receive per share if company distributed its net income. Analyzing each line up and down, line up and down uh, the statement as a proportion of the top line, which is revenue as we covered earlier, is known as a vertical analysis. It can be used to show the relative size of different expenses, for example. A horizontal analysis, on the other hand, compares the same figures across two or more periods and is useful for spotting trends or uh, use horizontal analysis to show year over year changes in a particular line item earnings before tax for the last three years, for example. And we'll go through that. Uh, what I'm gonna show you is gonna show you this, uh, an example of this, cause it has uh, the, I think it started in 2018 and it lets you see the history of how much things changed in every single line. So uh, it'll show you the ver vertical and horizontal as well. For investors analyzing stocks, one of the most popular financial ratios is the price to earnings ratio. Uh, using this financial ratio, investors can have a better idea of how to value the stock compares to another. Um, and I'm going to show you how to do the math for that, but a lot of places already have it in a lot of these sites that we go to uh, have this information on there already because, you know, it's, it's common knowledge. So the math is kind of done for you, but I'll go through it anyway. Despite its popularity, PE is just one tool at an investor's disposal. Another financial ratio that's relatively overlooked is the price to cash flow ratio. So use this ratio as a part of your analysis can help identify undervalued stock opportunities. And this is what we're actually uh, really want to see, you know, that we want to pay for uh, companies that are undervalued. So calculating the price to class cash flow ratio, the price to cash flow ratio is a simple calculation. All you have to do is take the current share price and divide it by the total cash flow from operations found on the cash flow statement. Some investors prefer to use a modified price to cash flow ratio that uses free cash flows instead of total cash from operations. Free cash flow adjusts for expenses such as amortization, what we've talked about, and depreciation, changes in working capital and capital expenditures. So the difference between cash flow and earnings, because this is something, I put this in here because this is something that confuses some people. Because just because you have uh, some cash flow laying around it doesn't qualify as your earnings, but we'll talk about it. To understand why the price to cash flow ratio matters, it helps to revisit some accounting principles. The profit and loss statement, also known as the P&L or income statement, does not always line up perfectly with the cash flow statement. It is there that are theoretically possible for a company to report huge profits and be unable to pay its bills due to liquidity problems. It's also possible for a company's P&L to give the impression that a company has less cash on hand than it actually does. So an example, you have 100,000 in cash from a trust fund to start a bakery. You spend 80,000 on equipment, leaving 20,000 in cash for working capital. You expect the company, uh, the equipment to last for 10 years. At the end of the 10 years, the equipment will have no remaining value. This is that amortization, uh, this is that uh, depreciation that we talked about that I gave the example with the car is the same concept there. So the balance sheet would show 80,000 in property, plant and equipment costs, 20,000 in cash and nothing else. At the end of the year, if you had no sales, your income statement would show $0 in revenue and 8,000 in, de in depreciation expense. So the reason it's 8,000 is that you estimated 80,000 in the next 10 years so, you know, 
That's just the average right there. The equipment will lose 80,000 worth over the next 10 years. So this figure analyzes that depreciation. All told, the balance sheet would calculate a pre-tax operating loss of $8,000. Thus, the balance sheet at the end of the year would be 20,000 cash, 80,000 property, uh, and retained earnings of negative 8,000. For the next 10 years, you would continue to mark down that 8,000 from your balance sheet to account for the depreciating value of the equipment. And this is a small, uh, very small thing. If the company owns the property that they're working in as well, if they're not renting, if they own it, that place that they live in is a depreciating, uh, depreciates, depreciating asset, sorry. Um, when we file, you and me, when we file our taxes at the end of the year, since we own homes, uh, I'm not sure if you know this or not, but part of what you file every year is a depreciation because the house gets older. You know that already? Yeah, so you're filing, uh, you're getting extra tax benefit for the depreciation estimate on your house. So that's just some extra knowledge out there. Uh, that doesn't capture the full reality of the situation. You aren't spending 8,000 in cash every year. You spent all that cash up front in the first year. However, a PE ratio is calculated uh, using the income statement earnings. So it includes depreciation, depreciation expenses. In reality, this company would have 8,000 more in cash than its P&L states. Uh, cash flow statement would reflect this discrepancy. That's not to say that this depreciation expenses are not worth paying attention to. They certainly are. And an investing guru, Warren Buffett, highlights them on his annual letter to shareholders. Rather, the price to cash flow ratio simply provides an alternate way of analyzing a stock, which is best used in conjunction with other ratios. So the price to cash flow works better in some industries. Accounting practices make it more common for some types of businesses and industries to either understate or overstate the profits of the income statement. That's why it helps to know multiple ways to value a company's ratio. So take pharmaceutical companies, for example, these companies are required to spend massive amounts on research and development when it's developing drugs. One could make a compelling argument that those expenses should not be accounted for all at once and the cost should instead be spread out over the years that drug is sold. By accounting for the entire expense as it occurs, a pharmaceutical company profits can seem both deflated during research and development and inflated toward the end of a drug's lifespan. In this scenario, the price to cash flow ratio would provide a better idea of how much uh, money management has to spend on further research and development. So basically the breakdown of all this is that um, some of these concepts that we're talking about are gonna apply better to some industries than other industries. Another industry that would be an example of this would be uh, like real estate investment trusts because their, their balance sheets are gonna be different than others because they by law have to pay back 90% of their earnings in dividends. So they're, they're, the way you will value them is gonna be different than the way you would value a company in the tech sector, for example. Uh, even if a, that company in the tech sector was paying dividends as well, you would still have to look at those from different uh, lenses because they, the way they handle their finances are both very different. Um, another example of capital intensive activities comes from the railroad industry. Investors can expect to see lower price to cash flow ratios compared to other industries because railroads and associated equipment require expensive upkeep. Um, another company that, another type of company that goes with this would be uh, like theme parks because it's very expensive to maintain roller coasters and uh, things like that. So you have to always keep that in mind and it's going to be different every quarter because uh, if you have, um, I think it's like Hershey Park in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, obviously the weather in Pennsylvania is different than the weather in California. So they can have the same rides, but, and this is macro, like this is big thinking, but I'm just, I, I feel like I need to put it out there, but there's going to be bigger depreciation in different places, depending on weather, even if it's the same exact industry. So that's just something else to keep in, in mind. Software companies, on the other hand, come from the industry where it's common to see much higher price to cash flow ratios. They have very low capital requirements. Once the product has been developed, it costs almost nothing to distribute it since it could be downloaded directly from cloud services or web browsers. Updating the software requires work, but not physical materials. A software designer simply needs a salary and they'll spend a year updating the software. 
the balance does not provide tax, investment, or financial services and advice. Uh, so what is price to earnings ratio? The price to earnings ratio is the ratio for valuing a company that measures its current share price relative to its uh, per share earnings, EPS. The price to earnings ratio is also sometimes known as the price multiple or the earnings multiple. And these multiples are a, a, like one of the big things that investors look at is how much they're paying for a company. And when, they're, when they refer to it, they're always going to refer to the multiple. So for example, uh, let's go back to the internet real quick. Um, can you see my screen? I'm on Amazon right now. All right, so let's, let's look for it. So uh, we'll just do a random one. Let's see. Pick a company. Pick a company. Um, Apple. He picked Apple. That means you got to go buy 10 shares on Monday. So I think it's, it shows it here. So the P ratio for Apple is 34.93 so that's what they would consider the multiple how many times earnings are you paying for it so let's look at tesla Now look at the look at the difference, man. So do you see why they say like it's overvalued? Like look how look at the difference in PE between both companies. So the PE ratio for this one is eight hundred and forty nine. Have you ever seen a PE that big? So he said Amazon back in the day was at a thousand, but uh yeah that's a a big forward that's a big PE and that's not even a forward PE that's a current today but we'll get back to it you good with all this I know it's, I know it's boring stuff but remember you you asked for it. all right PC uh, P ratios are used by investors and analysts to determine the relative value of a company's shares in apples to apples comparison it can also be used to compare a company against its own historical record or to compare aggregate markets against one another over time. Um, something people compare a company's multiple to uh, could be the multiple of the S&P 500, which is an average multiple of all the companies in the S&P 500. So sometimes that's used as a comparison. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you're, you're paying 15 times earnings or 14 times earnings, but you, you want to pay as little as possible when you're thinking about the multiples. So P ratio formula, formula and calcula calculation. Analysts and investors review a company's P ratio when they determine if the share price accurately represents the projected earnings per share. That's how you figure out if it's overvalued or not. The formula and calculation used for this process. So to determine the P value, one must simply divide the current stock price by the earnings per share. The current stock price can be gleaned by plugging a stock's ticker symbol in any finance website like we just did. Um, and this is what it looks like right here. P ratio equals market value per share divided by earnings per share. Um, so you, if you want to go do the math on your own later on, you can. All right. So uh, earnings per share comes in two main varieties. The first is metric listed in the fundamental section of most finance sites with the notation PE uh, TTM. Uh, and oh, it's a Wall Street acronym for the trailing 12 month PE. So it's just, it's backward looking, whereas the forward P is forward looking. Um, the second type of earnings per share is found in a company's earnings release, which often provides the guidance. This is the company's best educated guess of what it expects to earn in the future. Uh, sometimes analysts are interested, well, before I even go to that, um, a lot of the companies after the second quarter earnings, they cut this for the rest of the year. So they did not provide guidance on earnings per share for the rest of the year. 
Uh, some companies did it because they truly didn't know. And some other companies did it, um, just my opinion, but my opinion is that some companies did it just because uh, it takes, it relieves pressure off of them. If When they give that guidance that they're going to reach a certain amount of earnings per share for the next quarter or the remainder of the year, and they don't reach it, as you've seen already, since you've been analyzing the stock market, when that happens, the stock price goes down when they don't reach it. There's even times where they reach it and they, they match it or they even beat it by like one penny or something like that. And the stock still drops because it wasn't enough. Um, so the guidance that is provided on the previous quarter is really going to affect what happens in the next quarter. So again, in my opinion, I feel that since a lot of companies, they couldn't see, you know, because a lot of the countries closed down, a lot of the world was closed down. Uh, they couldn't provide a, a real estimate of what their future looks like. Some of these companies that could just took the opportunity to say, oh yeah, me too, uh, just to give them a little breathing room for the next few quarters. Sometimes analysts are interested in long-term valuation trends and consider the PE 10 or PE 30, which uh, averages the past 10 or 30 years of earnings respectively. These measures are often used when trying to gauge the overall value of a stock index such as the S&P 500, since these long-term measures can compensate for changes in the business cycle. The P-E ratio of the S&P 500 has fluctuated from a low of a, around six times uh, to over 120 times um, in 2009. The long-term average P-E for the S&P 500 is about 15 times. So again, that 15 times that we talked about, meaning that the stocks that make up the index collectively command a premium 15 times greater than their weighted average earnings. Um, so I just to finish it off, um, I put this on here just as a reminder of myself so I remember to talk about it. But um, these are two forms that must be filled out. So the Form 10-Q is a quarterly report mandated by the United States Federal Securities and Exchange Commission to be filed publicly by publicly traded corporations. Um, and the 10K is an annual report required by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, that gives a comprehensive summary of the company's financial performance. And before we get into the actual company, we'll go and we'll look at it. So SEC.gov, um, this is just another outlet for you. It's a free place to come and look. Um, but we can come here uh, off the top of my head. Let's just pick Walmart. So you come here, you click Walmart, and then you could click on this first link right here. Um, and just has historical documents. You could keep going as it shows next 40 here, but it has all these required documents that they're supposed to fill and it tells you what they are here. So we were talking about the 10Q and we could come look here at the documents or interactive data. Um, it has the 11K. So this is the annual report of employee stock purchases, savings, and similar plans. Um, but this is what it would look like. If you clicked on interactive data, it would load. Um, and it will show you, you could go to the cover page, the financial statements. Um, they have condensed versions of it. Now consolidated ones as well. Uh, it has basic information on them. Um, but this is just a place like, you know this is not a lie because this is straight from the government. So this is from the place where they they had to file. Um, so that's just an example of one of the documents. If you wanted to see the 10K, um, all you would have to go is go back. And let's see, they have the 8K. So the 10K would be right here. So there's the annual report. And then the 10Q is the quarterly report. Um, so if you ever want to go look at them, if you want to ever want to go find them, this is a, the legitimate place you could come and look for, uh, look for it. So this is another website while we were talking about the government. Um, this is another tool I think is, is, is pretty cool. Has a lot of tools in here. Is It's called investor.gov. Just another asset uh, for you, another tool for your toolbox. Um, again, and this is straight from the government. So you're not getting that, uh, like we talk about in the military, that Navy lawyer stuff. You're getting like legitimate straight from the government information. And it's, it's not just boring stuff. Like they actually have some good information, some great products in here as well. 
um, something like understanding fees. Um, I know this is a question that comes up a lot. Uh, and I was going to actually talk about this when we were talk. Uh, you wanted me to talk about uh, the mutual funds. Um, so the following chart in, uh, shows an investment portfolio with a 4% annual return. Um, so this is what it would look like if you had a 4% uh, with a 1% with a fee, 0.5% fee, a 0.25% fee. And you can see the difference that just that little bit percentage, point percentage makes. Um, and this goes hand in hand with kind of what you wanted to talk about, about uh, fees with mutual funds, right? Right or wrong? Right, yeah, so um, that just gives you a, a great picture to look at it. You know, the, just the difference of 180,000 here and you can make 210,000 in the same time frame just if you had different annual fees. So that's something I thought interesting, but just investor.gov one more time. Um, no, I'm not sponsored by investor.gov for anybody asking. All right, so this is the website that him and I just decided to pick. It's called Wix. We had never heard of it. I had never uh, heard of this company before. Let me minimize this. So any company that is publicly traded, 99% uh, of them on their public websites, you could go to walmart.com, target.com. So usually at the bottom or at the top in a tab, you're going to find some form of something that says investor. So you could come right here and look at investor relations. Um, the reason I like going straight to the company is because the company is the one that all these other companies like Yahoo, uh, uh, Yahoo Finance, um, Google, they're all getting their information from this, from this company. So if they made an error when they were inputting the information at Yahoo or at uh, Google or investor.gov, wherever you're looking for the information, then there's gonna be a discrepancy, but you can go the, to the exact company and find the uh, information straight from the horse's mouth. All right, so this one right here, they have something called the investor presentation, which, which happens uh, every quarter. So this is what it would look like right here. It's just an update. Uh, companies have it, it doesn't have to look in a certain format. Uh, move this over here. Um, but this is gonna have some of those numbers that you look at. So him and I were looking through this uh, to, and just analyzing some of this information, the numbers, but the way they're going to paint this is their own. So obviously the way they're going to paint it is going to be in the best possible way. No matter when, a, a, it's really bad when a company delivers bad guidance. That means that the leadership is bad because they really have, they couldn't find any way to put a positive spin on what's going on in their company, which is uh, really bad. But as you go through, you know, you got a lot of the fluff, um, but you get to the financials. Um, and this talks about uh, like everything that you see in the balance sheet, which we're going to look at next. But this is just kind of explains what's going on in that balance sheet. So if you have questions about certain numbers, most of the time, those numbers are going to be answered in this right here. Um, an outlook update is just that guidance that they're looking for right here. It says our outlook for quarter three reflects reflects continued momentum to new registered user growth as well as the growth in monetization of our user cohorts um, so this is the guidance that they gave they actually provided guidance so they're they have to stick to these numbers and if they don't reach these they're going to be their their stock is going to go down it always happens um, this is some of the stuff they expect so collections of 270 uh year-on-year -year growth um, that's another thing to look at year on year growth and quarter on quarter growth. Um, those are uh, some other things to look at when you're analyzing a company. Uh, we continue to experience trends that are tailwinds. So tailwinds, uh, you're going to hear this terms in the market a lot. Tailwinds means that it's something that's propelling the company forward and headwinds is something that's keeping the company from moving forward. So those are terms you may hear that I just wanted to cover real quick. Um, so non uh, operating expenses, non gap, gap and non-gap tax expenses, capital expenditures, depreciation expense expected to be approximately. But again, I won't sit here and go through uh, everything word by line by line, but so this is the, some of the stuff that they're talking about here. Um, and actually I wanted to go back cause I think I missed it. Let me see.
somewhere in here, him and I saw it where they where it said that they were investing 50% of their employees were research and development. And we just thought it was like insane. I thought it was insane personally that they they have like 3,000 people on staff or something like that. And out of those 3,000, half of those are just for research and development. Um, there was another link on here that we looked at that showed uh, everything that a company's done in the last like 10 years. And I can't find it. But uh, it's, it was funny because we were looking, looking through it and we were like, we couldn't, uh, we hadn't heard of any of those things that the company had said they had done. So it was, we just thought it was funny. But let's get out of this. All right, so view our financial da uh, and operating data. Please note that you're not answering a website. Got it. Um, so a lot of the places they're going to give you the option to export the data to Excel. Uh, him and I did that earlier because I wanted to remove some of the, I wanted to just see the, this quarter and the previous quarter. Um, I didn't want to see everything, but this is going to show you that horizontal and vertical um, that we were referring to earlier. Uh, so yeah, it, kind of, it looks kind of messy in this aspect right here, but you could look at the quarterly statement or the annual. Uh, so year on year, um, this is the horizontal. When you look at year on year, how much they've improved or lost or anything like that. Um, or you could go quarter on quarter, but the quarter was a lot of them. So what I ended up doing was exporting the data to Excel in order to see it. Um, so the way their balance sheet is set up is, is kind of like, very uh, confusing. Some other companies have like a more professional looking balance sheet. Uh, let me see, I'll, I'll export the data. And then I'll share my screen on Excel. All Uh, can you see Excel? All right. Yeah, so on Excel, what I ended up doing was just, uh, I went through and hid a lot of them. And so all I had to look at was this pre the current and the previous. So you can look at the income statements and you know, this is how much historically they're spending on research and development. So I could just highlight this whole thing and then go side by side and it'll show me how much they're spending on something like uh, research and development. But again, this show, I'm looking at too many years, hold on. And you can look at as many as you want. For right now, I just wanna do the quarter one and quarter two, just to, to make it easy to look at. But yeah, man, everything is pretty self-explanatory on here. So how much revenue did they make? Um, then you have other things like their subscription. This is going to be stuff that is not the same for every company. And that's one of those things that I was referring to earlier when you can't compare stuff because it's not apples to apples. There's a lot of it's apples to like oranges because they're both, they both are publicly traded, but this one uh, it has a subscription base, whereas another company may not have something that's subscription based. So they're not going to have this stuff right here. So this is where you would look at the EBITDA, um, but cost of revenue, um, gross profit, gross margin, like all the numbers are here. And obviously if it's a company that you want to invest in, you want to look at things where they're making more money uh, at the end of the day. That's what you want to look at. And you want to look at stuff like the net loss being less than it was the previous year. So they're losing 
on quarter two, they lost more money than they lost in quarter one. Um, and this is why it's nice to look at the actual balance sheet because again, when you go look at that uh, presentation, when him and I were looking at it, they were painting this in a positive view. Like they were making it all look, they put the pretty colors out there, like those attractive colors to look at. They have pictures, uh, but don't let it distract you from what's actually going on out there. Things like this, like they're losing more money. Um, their taxes, their uh, other expenses. Uh, then if you go down here to other financial, uh, so this is the capital. The depreciation that we were talking about is listed right here. And, that, and that'll change accordingly. Um, realized gains and losses, uh, change in deferred revenue. But yeah, man, do you have any questions? I've been talking for a while. I need some water. I know you got a question. Um, no, none, none yet. I'm trying to take it all in. Yeah, man. So as we go through here, like, uh, it's like, like I said, it's all, all the stuff we talked about are all going to appear here. So there's the amortization right here, like how much they've been paying towards their debt. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I wanted to show you how to do it. So it kind of restarted this. Stuff. I already had all this shit hidden, but excuse my language. I already had all this stuff hidden, but um, there you go. Amortization. That's how much they've been paying towards their debt. Uh, depreciation. The net loss that we looked at, that number is the same. Uh, and then they have stuff broken down in different ways. So the net cash provided by operating activities, this is how, how much from operating activities they took back into their actual pocket. Uh, then you add that with this one right here and you add it with this over here. Um, but yeah, uh, let's see, let's test, let's see, uh, like pick a company, uh, any random company. Uh, AT&T. Great, great. Let's see. Let's, let's uh, test it out. Let's go see if um, AT&T, let me delete all this stuff up here. But let's see if AT&T has theirs on their website. They should, and then we can take a look at theirs. Yo. All right, so I guess we could look over here. Maybe at the bottom. Nah, so this one don't don't have it on here. So let's see. AT&T investor relations. They said something about investor on um, emails. So I guess they send you emails too if you're an investor. But they have their own website just for their investors. Uh, but on here, you could come and see their financial reports, uh, stock information, uh, news and events. So these are, again, uh, stuff that's coming straight from, from them. Uh, you can look at their conference call. It's going to happen on October 22nd. Uh, if we were in the States, we could call in for free and we could listen in on the conference call. Um, and so you like, as an investor, you actually have a seat at the table, you know, and some of the smaller cap companies will even allow like a person like us who only has like a few shares of it. Like we could ask a question about what's going on. Cause we're invested in it at the end of the day, you know, we're investors in it and there may be something that's keeping you from being investing more. And you want to just ask the horse uh, what's going on so the you can hear it from the horse's mouth. Um, we got a nosebleed ticket. <laughs> uh, but yeah, man. Uh, you, got anything? you got any questions? Um, I'm asking him. So what are the credit 
Spirit stores. Hold on. I'm going to stop share. So this is what he's asking for. Hold on. I'm going to edit out all this quiet stuff out. Do you see the uh, explorer? Yes, sir, I can see it. So this is what he asked for. Does he make credit rating? Yeah, I, I specifically said credit scores for me, but it is credit rating. Into, I was pushing similar to us having credit scores. Come, come on. So I think he's referring to the Better Business Bureau. Uh, is that what you're referring to? Uh, he asked about a company's credit score. Uh, I thought rating, but. No, rating, rating is correct. But I was tying it into how we call it score, and essentially it's the same thing. But just like how we we brag about our credit score, it's it just like a leeway to say, hey, companies have credit ratings. And how we refer to... Uh, He's coming over. Real quick, how we refer to... Um, who, who, so who's our credit scores, right? Uh, credit score reports. So you have Equifax, you have FICO, um, but for the credit rate, uh, for, for companies, um, their agencies are Moody's and Standard & Poor's. So it's no different, right? No different if we got a car, the higher your credit score, the better the rate. And the higher, the higher they are rating, the better rates that they get. So you have AAA, AA, um, single A, um, triple B. So Moody's has its own grading system and Standard & Poor's has their own grading system. But the lower your score, the more interest they pay. No, it's, it's really the same thing. Um, I know it, without getting too deep into it, um, that's very important, right? Like no different for us. Our credit score is very important, right? So their credit score is very important. Investors look at that too. Um, also, why is it important? Because the lower your credit score, the less available um, money that you, you could get. So pension funds and 401ks, they, they're only allowed to invest in investment grade um, debt. So that's like, I, I wanna say, the, I could be wrong, but I wanna say the lowest is single A. Um, anything beneath that is considered junk, um, junk bonds or like junk debt. And it's considered high risk, high risk of defaulting. And obviously they're not allowed to invest in that. So, um, it's no, it, it sounds complicated, but the balance sheet is no different from your own balance sheet. So, um, I, I know Chiwo said he looked at, uh, the EBITDA, which is, yes, that's very important. I'm the type of guy, um, I gravitate towards the debt first. Um, I, I wanna know how much debt you have. Um, debt can either, uh, that, that, that's the precursor if you could freely spend the money that you're getting or if you can't. So for me personally, I'm, I'm a little conservative. Um, everything falls around the debt. Yeah, man. Well, now you got, you got some uh, extra tools for your toolbox. Uh, you got the Standard & Poor website. You saw the Moody's website. It seemed like Moody's was something you had to pay for, but they had some, uh, looked like some free stuff on there as well. Um, you got a lot of different places to go and look at and find this information. Some companies are going to be better for one thing. Some other places are going to be better for another type of information. Uh, 
get it from multiple sources. You know, uh, don't just look at one place for everything because one place could be missing out on something. Sometimes, I don't know if you've noticed this as well, but sometimes uh, Yahoo will be delayed on certain information or uh, on, like macro trends will be delayed on certain information. So what you're looking at is not the most accurate up to date. And if you're, if you're looking at something and you're going to purchase it in the same day, you know, you want to find the most up-to-date information on what's going on. Um, and you're not going to get that from the company because the company is only going to release that 10K or that 10Q, that conference call or that quarterly report. And that's the only time you're going to hear uh, specifics on numbers from the company. Um, unless it's some, something happening like, you know, Apple trying to purchase, I mean, you know, Microsoft trying to purchase TikTok or little things like that that you'll hear every so often. But you, you really hear on in the media about maybe less than a hundred companies over and over and over again, but there's over 4,000 companies on the stock market. Does that make sense? So again, like that Wix, had you ever, have you ever heard of Wix before? Yeah, I've seen them a few times before, but they didn't really know what they, what they did. Yeah, man. So we, uh, we, we had never heard of it at all. And, that was just one that we decided to look into just a little bit because he wanted to gauge, you know, the, how the, the world was doing as a whole in the business sectors. So that was just one thing we looked at. But, man, uh, we've been here over an hour. I don't want to make this too, too long. Um, I hope you got something out of it, man. Uh, do you feel like you did? Oh, yeah, definitely. You did. And if, if not, man, I'm going to post this up so you can go back and look at it maybe a little slower. Or, and I'm going to also you know, email out, uh, just comment below if you want an email with that uh, Word document. There's some great information in there. You could take your time, read it slow. Uh, every, like almost every other paragraph in there, you could stop and go just do a Google search on one of those individual words that you never heard before or, or uh, phrases like PE ratio, find out what a forward PE is. You should know these things. That way you can talk intelligently with somebody else that knows what they're, uh, what they're talking about. Uh, but besides that, uh, you got anything else? You got anything else? Yeah, just one quick question. So when it comes to PE ratios, what's a, what would be a PE ratio that would, that would deem a company fairly valued by its overvalued? So it's all relative to, I would say relative to its competitors, man, because um, some companies rate a higher PE just because of the industry they're in and how much money they're making or where we are in the business cycle as a whole, because there are certain times that we're in a certain part of the business cycle where one industry is just going to thrive and do better. So they'll rate those higher PE ratios, you know, but if you wanted like the generic answer, you could just go right here. And something, something as simple as what is a good P.E. ratio? What is a good P.E. ratio for a stock? So the P, this is the Google answer. The higher P.E. ratio shows that investors are willing to pay. Let's see. Uh, for the average P.E. historically is from 13 to 15. For example, a company with a current P.E. of 25 above the S&P 500 trades at 25 times earnings. We covered that. But the generic answer is that 13 to 15 is a fair value. But the correct answer is that it really all depends on that specific industry and that specific moment in time. Because again, man, you have a company like Tesla who's trading at a 834 times earnings. Uh, so like <laughs> compare 834 to the average right here, which is 13 to 15, you know, some, pe some investors in Tesla will be like, that's a great multiple. Um, other people are like, you're bugging. Like, that's not a great multiple. You know, so um, you have to look at it where it's, where it's at, where it's competitors and things like that. I know it's not the answer you want to hear. It may or may not be. But uh, is the same answer that I would give you for AT&T is not the same answer that I would give you for Amazon. Because Amazon is going to rate that higher PE. Uh, just because it has a PE, like Facebook, I think Facebook is 34. Uh, Facebook has a, a, like a lot of money in cash. They have no debt. They have a lot of uh, other entities. Like they rate that higher PE. Does that make sense? Does anything else, ma'am? 
No, that's it. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, I'll look out for when you post the video so I can get the in the PowerPoint or the, the Word document. All right. Uh, besides that, uh, if you stuck around, if you stuck around and watched up until this point, like really appreciate you. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share this with your friends. It's a lot of great information on here. And this is like higher level information. It's like kind of more higher level than we usually share. So this, uh, you know, bear with us, go back, watch it again. Uh, don't make sure you didn't miss anything. Uh, but besides that, until next time.